Hey there, my favorite Rainbow Warrior patrons. It's the end of the month and time for a riot on our unicorns. The unicorns have been doing pretty well at the Seabreeze Studio stables, although I think the cold weather here has made them a little bit lazy. They seem to be putting on some extra weight. I think they're going to be very happy to get out for that ride. Can I just ask, what the fuck is going on here in the United States? First the Nashville school shooting, and then a week and a half later, another mass shooting at a bank in Louisville, Kentucky. According to Wikipedia, which I don't reference often, there were 52 mass shootings in January of this year. That resulted in 87 deaths and 205 wounded. 43 mass shootings in February with 54 deaths and 160 injured. 39 mass shootings in March, 55 dead and 105 injured. And since April isn't quite over, we don't have a tally yet. But since the year started, we've had 134 mass shootings in the United States. And that's not counting April. It's downright scary out there. To be honest, I wrote this Patreon exclusive a couple weeks ago and those statistics have probably increased. It's getting to the point no one's going to want to leave their homes. But then again, are we safe at home? I don't know, warriors. I think I prefer my little fantasy land I live in at the Seabree Studio stables. It's safe here in my brain and I don't get dark ideas or urges to kill. Unless I'm playing Call of Duty on my Xbox. Thankfully, otherwise y'all would have to have me committed. I hope you're doing good. And I'd love it if you'd reach out and let me know what's going on in your life. I'm writing a book, or I should say I've been working on a book. It's a series of short stories about LGBTQ plus teenagers that have been murdered. The story I have for you today is the second story in that book. If you're all ready to go, I'm ready to tell you about the story of Jessica Hernandez. So get on your unicorns and ride! <laughs> Giddy up, sparkle farts, and let's get on with the story. The Denver, Colorado police policy states that officers should not shoot into moving vehicles unless the officer is in imminent danger. And yet, even with this policy in place, 17-year-old Hispanic lesbian Jessica Hernandez was fired upon and killed as she was in a car with three friends in a stolen Honda. Jessica, who went by Jesse, was no saint. Of course, not many of us are. She was a teenager and she did some stupid-ass things, like stealing a car. Yes, she made mistakes. We all do. But Jessie wasn't a hardcore troubled teenager either. She lived in her family's mobile home with her parents and five siblings. Her family wasn't well off. They struggled to make ends meet. But for the most part, they were a loving family living on the line of poverty. Jessie was an advocate against bullies, and she always cheered on and tried to protect the underdogs, the nerds, the less fortunate. She even occasionally would bring stray animals home to take care of. Jessie had a kind heart, and she did her best to be a good friend. On January 1, 2015, Jessie, who had a revoked driver's license, had taken her mom's car out. She wasn't the safest driver on the road. She had what some of us call a lead foot. Jessie liked to drive fast. She was north of Denver when she was pulled over by a Colorado state trooper for going 80 miles per hour. This was in a 55 mile per hour speed zone on the interstate. The trooper claimed Jesse was trying to elude him and resist arrest in a manner that threatened his safety and others. He did not shoot into her moving vehicle to stop her. And eventually she came to a stop on her own. I'm not exactly sure why he would say she was trying to elude arrest. Why would you arrest someone for a speeding ticket? And there was no further comment on the officer's report about it. 
This statement by the state trooper clearly makes no sense. But three weeks later, after her death on January 26th, the citation she received was dismissed. How kind of them. The night of January 25th, 2015, Jessie and a few of her friends had stolen a silver-colored Honda Accord. See Dumb Choices by Teenagers. With Jessie as the driver, the teens in the car were 15 years to 17 years old, and they were out doing some joyriding. Around 3 a.m., they pulled into the back of an alley of a residential section in Denver, and they fell asleep. Around 6.30 a.m., residents in nearby homes were waking up. They were getting ready for their day. One noticed a suspicious-looking vehicle in the back alleyway. It was just sitting there idling. It was January and most likely very cold, so the car was running with the heat on while the teens slept. The windows appeared to be fogged up and the neighbor called the police to report the car. An officer responded and ran the plates of the vehicle, discovering that the vehicle had been reported stolen. He called for a backup officer. By now, one of the teenagers in the car had awoken, and she alerted the other teens in the car that the cops were there. Another officer arrived on the scene. Slowly, with their guns drawn, they began to approach the stolen vehicle with the teenage inhabitants. According to the officers, they yelled for the occupants to get out of the car, hands where they could see them. But instead... Jessie put the vehicle in reverse, and she slowly tried to back away from the police, although it appeared that they were blocked in the alleyway by the two police cars. One of the officers, who was standing physically to the side of the stolen car, he alleged he was nearly pinned between the car and a fence. He knew he was about to be squashed if he didn't do something quickly, so he fired into the car. This same officer claimed that his leg was injured, a description that has been elaborated upon by the Denver Police Department, first saying that the officer's leg was broken, fractured, and then simply injured. He supposedly was treated at a hospital and then released. The other officer also fired several times into the car, striking the driver, Jesse. All in all, Jessie was shot four times. She was shot twice in her torso, once in her pelvis, and once in her right thigh. Coroners believe that the bullet that hit her pelvis might have ricocheted off the pelvis bone, causing the damage to her right thigh. The final fatal shot? It damaged her heart and lungs, killing Jessie. The teenage witnesses also in the car have an account of what happened, and it differed greatly from the narrative painted by the two police officers, who, by the way, did not have dashboard cameras or body cams. The teens in the car with her say she was shot first. She lost control of the car, and that's when the vehicle started to veer into one of the officers. When the car came to a stop, Jessie, who possibly was already dead, and if she wasn't, she was unconscious, was yanked from the stolen vehicle, thrown to the ground face first, causing injury to her nose, and she was handcuffed. Jessie's autopsy report indicated that none of the shots fired from the officers were at close range, disputing the fact that Jessie was driving at one of the officers. Serious doubts of the officer's claims that Jesse was driving towards them has been raised, but unfortunately it has not been proven. Both of the officers were on a paid leave while an investigation occurred. Both officers who claimed self-defense were cleared of any criminal wrongdoing in Jesse's murder. Her parents filed a civil suit against the Denver Police Department. Sadly, Jessie's body tested positive for low amounts of marijuana and alcohol, plus the stolen vehicle. It could seriously be a detriment to their case if they proceeded. With the exception of very recently, as recent as January 2023, no Denver police officer has been indicted for over a generation. 
not since 1992. It's said that the district attorney's office wears kid gloves when dealing with the Denver Police Department. This is in spite of four officers shooting into moving vehicles within a seven-month time period in 2015. The recent indictment was due to a Denver cop shooting at a suspect and injuring five other innocent bystanders in the process. Rest in power, Jesse. Our true crime quickie comes to us from England, 2012. By the way, welcome back to Patreon, true crime nana. I missed ya. 31-year-old Jody Barnes and 32-year-old Kelly Barnes, they were in a civil partnership, and that's like a domestic partnership here in America. They lived nomadic-type lives, which I guess is a nice way of saying they were homeless. Both women also had a very nasty drug problem. They had previous records for violence and both lived very chaotic lifestyles. It was one of those relationships where they were so similar and yet so toxic for each other at the same time. The women had just spent 500 American dollars on crack cocaine and heroin, so now they were broke. That same day, they met a frail 67-year-old gentleman who used to drive a bus for a living by the name of Barry Reeve. Barry now lived on his retirement pension. The women saw him out and about that day, and they thought he looked like he had some money stashed somewhere. He seemed like an easy mark. Kelly approached him, and she offered up Jody for sexual services to him. Barry agreed, but said he preferred Kelly. Kelly said okay, and that both of the women would go with him. The women accompanied Barry to his home. Once they were there, Kelly and Jody started to beat Barry with their fists and kick him with their feet. Jody turned up the volume of the television to drown out the sound of Barry's screams. Then the torture would begin. The women would take turns cutting Barry with a knife. By inflicting more pain, the women wanted Barry to tell them his PIN number for his bank account. While he lay bleeding on the floor of his home, they walked around and over his body looking for money and anything of value that they might be able to steal from him. Every time they'd walk by him or over him, they'd stomp on him. They'd punch him, or they'd jab him with a knife. Barry's death was not immediate. It took this poor man, who was someone's father, someone's grandfather, roughly 48 hours before he passed away. He laid there in pain and agony as these little bitches helped themselves to his belongings. They would leave his residence for a short bit and come back for more stuff. Most likely they had a place that they were squatting at, and that's where they were stashing Barry's belongings. Kelly and Jody's last trip back to Barry's home was to raid his refrigerator and his freezer and take all of his food. Seventeen days later, Barry's bloody, bludgeoned body was found by his daughter, who had not heard from her father for over two weeks. She was concerned, so she dropped by. She immediately saw blood smears on his door. This added to her worry. She panicked, and she called the Metro Police. After detectives scoured the area surrounding Barry's home and on the inside of it, they received a hit on Barry's bank card. Someone had been trying to access it through an ATM. Police quickly captured the CCTV footage at the bank, and it was of Kelly and Jody trying to withdraw money from Barry's bank account. Detectives were able to hunt the women down, arrest, and charge them with capital murder. Funny thing, though. When the heat was on, both women ditched their previous love for each other to tell the officials that it was their civil partner who murdered Barry, and they just watched. In court, both women would carry a Bible into their trial with them. They were trying to prove they were good people being part of a religious book club. Jody presented worse than Kelly, though. She had multiple outbursts claiming that God had come to her on many occasions. God spoke with her, and God had forgiven her for all of her sins. While God might have forgiven Jody, 
and even Kelly, the good people of England, had not. The jury found both of these hot messes guilty, and the judge ordered them both to serve a prison term of at least 24 years. Jody broke down in hysterics as the sentence was read. She kept saying, But I didn't lie. I swore on a Bible. In an interview I read with Kelly's ex-husband, he said that Jody was a manipulator. He claimed that Jody had this bizarre control over Kelly, and she forced Kelly to do many things against Kelly's will. Maybe. But Kelly was a big girl, for crime's sake. She was a 32-year-old woman. Rest in power, Barry. That's it. We're back at the Seabreeze Studio Stables, my friends. I have to go and record a longer case for the regular show now. I'm hoping to get it out on time, but it might be a wee bit late. It's the case of a serial killer with tons of victims, and trying to get the timeline right on those was a hair-pulling experience, to say the least. But I'll do my best to be on time. Love you guys, and remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. <laughs>